Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar on 2024 Data and Analytics Trends and Predictions. In just a moment, I'll pass it over to our presenters, Sumit Paul and Reed Maloney. Sumit is an ex-Gartner analyst working in the data and analytics space, now a contributing analyst with Eckerson Group. Reed is the CMO of Dremio. He is a cloud data and AI marketing executive with a history of building and leading high growth marketing teams at AWS, Oracle, and H2O.ai. In today's webinar, Reed and Sumit will be presenting on four areas, Lakehouse, Open Table Formats, Data Mesh, and AI. Without further ado, I'll pass the mic to Reed. Hey, thank you so much. Hi, everybody. Yeah, it's great to be here today. You know, one of the things we know that a lot of our customers go through at this time of year is they're trying to figure out what their priorities are, what their initiatives should be as they enter the new year. And so what better way than to have a survey that goes through and says, what are your peers doing? What's everyone interested in? And so we cataloged on these four topics that we talked about, Lakehouse, Data Mesh, Open Table Formats, which is obviously critical to the Lakehouse and AI. And so in each of these sections, what we're going to go through is we'll go through some of the results that we found from the survey. We do have an overall report, white paper that has a lot more detail. We, we interviewed 500 different organizations that will help you benchmark and see what your peers are up to in the space. With that, I, I want to get started in just sort of a foundation of Dremio and uh, the overall Lakehouse space as we get into this. And I just want to also highlight, like, use the chat and the Q&A. We're going to go section by section. So we're going to go sort of our findings. We're going to see what's happening, you know, with customers and what we're seeing from the analyst point of view here uh, with Sumit. And then we'll take your questions too at each section and at the end. So really depending on what makes sense for you, we're going to be flexible as we go through each environment because we know you have different priorities and different pain points that you're trying to address right now. So one of the things we keep hearing from customers and that we look at is like this sort of amounts to what a lot of our customers are trying to do and what we think of as data analytics nirvana right now, which is as things have continued to go on this digital and AI transformation trend is more data adoption. This is the data culture elements. This is the data usage. This is self-service becomes really important in organizations. And we think about that as just like the sheer number of individuals and the sheer number of queries that you're running across your business. And most data leaders want to see these numbers going up. The challenge is that can put a lot of stress on the system. So it's hey, how are we going to manage that and deal with costs and scale when that happens? And so you want the queries and adoption going up while you want the costs going down. And by the way, at the same time, you want to be able to get a lower mean time to insight. You want the individual to say, hey, I want to go figure this out. Well, what do you need to go do? You typically need to go compile different data together, create the view that you need, and then query that view, right? And then Depending on how you built that view, you could create a lot of tax on the system again, putting another problem back into cost. And so we're going to talk about a bit how lake houses and specifically Dremio helped to solve this. And one of the ways we view this is like, look, this the, the problem with achieving any of this right now is the current state, which is I got all these sources. I'm often loading them into a lake and then I'm doing ETL pipelines into a warehouse to create the, uh, the data models and schemas I need for each of my different lines of business. And then I got a whole varying view of clients that are interacting with that. I got reports that are going on an ongoing basis. They're running every day. I got ad hoc analytics. I got my data scientists that are exploring out of the lake and the warehouse and trying to pin that together to build models. And the issue is this is really complex, right? Each of these different stages creates another breakpoint. And so when we talk to engineers, we spend a lot of time talking to data engineers. They're still spending, they're spending nearly 30% of their time on backfills, data backfills. And the reason why they're spending so much time on data backfills is if everything on the client side is not hitting accurate data, then there's no point in ever actually running that query or the data science job is going to create something that is inaccurate. You then have to go back and still trace back to the source, what broke, what happened, et cetera. And so lake houses in general are helping to solve this. And we think about this as shifting left, right? Which is how do we get the consumers closer to the data? How do we simplify all the steps and the pipeline in this? Okay, so in this case, if you have a lake house, and we'll talk about open table formats enabling you to do full warehousing capabilities on the lake, you're actually eliminating one step out of that. And so you're getting a lot closer, but you still have a bunch of complexities. So your cost does come down by moving to a lake house, but 
And, and then I got, sorry, it's also faster because you have less steps to go and say, hey, how do I go and create, you know, move, take the data sources I need and deliver data to the business. This is getting us closer to what we want. But the problem is they don't by themselves enable self-service. Right? And there's a few things that customers need that we found out talking to them to actually enable the self-service and shift farther left than just a lake house allows. And this is something that we think is specific and what we've been building here at Dremio. So number one is we want the consumers. We know the central teams you know, and the engineer teams are still going to be there to, to help, but we want to get them as close to the data as possible so we can improve adoption while we're still lowering mean time to insight and lowering costs and headaches. So the first one of those is you need a fast and intelligent query engine. And I'll give you on the next slide, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about what we mean by an intelligent query engine that allows the consumer to get closer to the data without killing the system. And it's really important, right? As we're creating a bunch of views, you could put a ton of tax on the system as the business just goes crazy and they have layered views. And those are all schema on read, and it just adds up and puts a massive drain on the sort for compute to do full table scans. We don't want that. And so we'll, we'll, we have a solution to that within the query engine. The next is you need an intuitive user experience, right? The consumers can't move left unless they can actually easily use the system, find the data, do the discovery, and build the views and the queries that they need to run on that and the dashboards that they want to hook up. And then you need a level of next-gen data ops capabilities. Like we talked about, you need streamlined pipelines that can be highly automated and easy to troubleshoot. So here's an example of what Dremio does in this case. So if you have all these data sources, you can bring in that data. Purple are physical sets, whereas green here are views. So physical versus views. So the data sources come in. In this example, we're showing you can have voter data and voter survey data, and you bring that together into enriched voter data. And then you might split that up and you have Ohio voters or Illinois voters. Again, just an example. What we have is you're going to end up being querying something like Ohio voters. And if you're querying Ohio voters and you're figuring out that you're putting a lot of load on the system, we have this technology called reflections. And so we will basically build we will, and we recommend these to you based on what we see in system usage. We'll say, look, you should have a materialization of this view but you don't need to ever rewrite the queries. The business can keep creating the views and querying those views. And our query engine will be aware that the materialization exists and it will rewrite the SQL at runtime and call the materialization. And so this allows your analysts and your consumers to go out and run really fast and do what they need to do, dropping mean time to insight. But it also allows you behind the scenes to just manage performance by building the materializations that you need to reduce costs and improve performance. And because the query engine can recognize those materializations, they don't need to talk to each other, right? So the engineers can manage systems and the analysts can run really fast. And that is a core element of what we call about the our intelligent query engine and the, the technology we call that as reflection. So a big part of helping customers shift left. So as part of this survey sort of level set is we went out to 500 data leaders and practitioners and we interviewed them across this area. Again, this report is available. We'll be sending it to everybody that's on right now and everyone that registered. Um, and so you'll see we have questions across the spectrum of these four different areas. And the first one is data lake houses. So as I just talked about the benefits of a lake house, what we've seen is that awareness of people being very familiar with the lake house concept, which in this case of the survey, we described a lake house as a lake house combines the performance functionality and governance of a warehouse with the scalability and cost advantages of a data lake. And 85% said they're very familiar. And while we, this is the first year we did that sur the survey, so we don't have anything to compare it to, I've looked at other industry data and it looks like the year before it was less than half of this. And you'd say, well, why, you know, if it's if it's already so high when something gains awareness so quickly in the market, that's typically because it's driving a significant amount of value. And so we'll see, I'm going to get into it later about those value drivers that we see from either you or your peers that's saying like, why is this spreading so quickly? Why is adoption happening so fast? And related to adoption is what we see here on this slide in three years, 70% almost 70%, 69% believe that the lake house will be the primary way they run analytics in their organization. And so we actually believe that this year, and I don't have the data to support this, this is my own prediction in a blog I wrote recently, 
which is, I believe this is the year. By the end of the year, the lake house will be the primary format for analytics, the primary architecture, I should say, for analytics within organizations. The shift is happening that quickly as the open table formats are adopted, again, which we'll talk about later. So, you know, what's driving this? Like, that's really the question. We were like, wow, this is crazy findings. Like, what, what, what is driving so much push into the lake house right now? And one of the main reasons is economics. So we, what we've already seen is that more than half of the people we surveyed, again, this was done by a third party. So this is outside of the Dremio ecosystem. This is just a data and analytics space. More than half think they're going to save more than 50%. And when you go up here, you're already seeing like 20% think they'll save 76 to 100%. And in general, when we look at our customers, we do see a lot of that 80%-ish savings. So somewhere between five to 10 X, you know, that's the 80 to 90% when they actually do a TCO analysis uh, of using Dremio. Now this is specific to a lake house, not specific to Dremio in terms of the data I'm presenting right now. But we feel like if you see this flip, some of it's gotta be from a scale perspective, you know, in terms of the number of sources and combining sources. And we'll talk about that, that we saw on data mesh, the number of sources we see. But a big part of the drivers, obviously, economics right now, where data organizations are just asking to do a lot more with flat or even lower budgets. And a lake house is, a great, you know, is great for them because in many cases, they're already flowing data in the lake. And so now they're able to just use capabilities in the lake and they're, they're doing data modeling in the lake instead of a warehouse. And they're really bringing their costs down significantly. On that note, it's probably not surprising where the data is coming from then which is 42%, which is the leading source, are actually coming from cloud data warehouses. So a lot of organizations, you know, they went to improve scale in the cloud and agility in the cloud. And so a lot of data moved from either data lakes, or in this case, mainly enterprise data warehouses, or for new workloads, and they moved them into cloud data warehouses. And even though they just did that work, they're still going and adopting lake houses, right? So that just tells you that's where the value difference is. And I'm gonna show you just you know our own TCO against Snowflake here in a moment, but we see the same thing. We see the same driver and we see a lot of customers coming to us with this pain point right now. But you also see a lot of people just sort of skipping the step, right? They still have enterprise data warehouses. Let's call that Teradata for now. And they're saying, hey, how do I do what I'm doing in Teradata and potentially gain more flexibility and serve more customers and lower my mean time to insight? by going to a data lake, in our case, coming to Dremio. And we see that as well happening. Almost surprising where you'd think the lowest hop is going from a data lake where often they're using Hive and moving that into a table format like Iceberg and going into more of a lake house environment from a lake environment is actually the smallest percentage. And our hypothesis there, we don't really know. And Sumit, this might be a good place for us to sort of debate that. I have one more slide and then we'll sort of look at this item is, well, you know, does that align with what you would think or you'd see? I just think this is what the data gravity is. Like, where is the data? Well, this is sort of a representation of where the data is and then who has pain with their data in terms of scale, cost, delivering insights and, and driving value from the data itself. We should see that reflected in this chart for people moving to the lake house environment. And it would be interesting to see what, what you're seeing, you know, outside in the whole market on this one. So I'm going to go back to you, you know, just very quickly on this slide, we did go and do this. We have this paper on our site. You can go through and read the entire way we did this based on using a TCBDS benchmark and uh, a variety of other assumptions that are baked in. And, and while we actually see our customers save more than this, our TCO analysis going through with TCBDS shows that customers are going to save more than half using Dremio over something like Snowflake. And that, again, aligns exactly to what the data showed, where they said more than 50%, you know, 56% said they had more than 50% that I showed. That really aligns with what our TCO analysis was showing as well. So Sumit, just sorry to mean to, to grab you there, but yeah, like, is this, you know, how does this relate to what you're seeing in terms of lake house adoption? in terms of the metrics and with the customers you're talking to on a day in and day out basis? Yeah, this actually resonates with what I am so noticing as an independent analyst. And, and even while I was at Gartner, 
that the data lakehouse adoption it's becoming sort of the default platform now for um, organizations building their data analytics uh, especially lakehouses now with their capabilities of you know storing working with unstructured data which is kind of the fundamental raw material when you are working with gen ai and which we'll see later it's the best platform to work with unstructured data where you know you can and it's also very open where you can integrate different sorts of data whether it's audio video images text data you can also integrate a lot of third party libraries within lakehouses much more easily than um, cloud data warehouses or enterprise data warehouses which are sort of closed systems proprietary proprietary data formats you cannot bring in new libraries and we know the ml and ai space the rate at which it is it is it is growing right so data lake houses once they started understanding the limitations of data lakes in terms of schema evolution how doing slowly changing dimensions how handling updates and inserts and upserts was so difficult in data lakes once lake houses made those changes with the table formats you know there was no looking back and organizations could very easily jump into lake houses and start building their data pipelines especially doing backfills with data lakes was such a big problem it was such a big work around so i am actually seeing the same kind of trends read as what i see with data lakes being adopted and reducing the time to insights with self service capabilities providing git like version control systems where you can quickly do time travel and things like that especially important when you are doing machine learning based explainability where you know data scientists need to go back to their training data at a certain point in time to figure out why a model is not working you know to my expected um, precision or accuracy so this is definitely what i do see as well and last point a lot of the organizations when data lakes first came in they jumped into the data lake but there were organizations who waited for you know figuring out how late data data lakes evolve and that's why now you are seeing a much higher trend of these customers who are moving who never moved to the data lake version 1 2 but now are directly recognizing the problems associated with um, cloud data warehouses and they are now moving directly to a lake house platform so that's what i would i would like to say but You know, I think one of the things in your answer I'm picking up is there's a lot of flexibility difference, you know, the you're not held hostage by your own data, right? Because it's not a proprietary format and so you can, you know, the all the vendors and tools that you decide to use, you know, they have to earn your business every year because it's a lot easier to sort of change them out or move them in or try things out within because you're like, look, I uh, this I'm in an open table format, I can use this broad ecosystem. you know obviously one of the ones we're talking about is is you know that we saw specifically is related to cost overall you know have you seen that too or have you seen it more on the flexibility side in terms of the drivers uh for the companies that you're advising yeah the cost is also a, a major factor right a lot of organizations who went to the data lake they had to maintain the data lakes as well as the cloud data warehouses which was double the cost right because there was a time when the query engines in the data lakes were not very fast in terms of latency with high concurrency right so you, right. so organizations had to keep their data warehouses but now with the advances that dremio has done with their sql engines um, you know dremio sonar working on apache arrow format with materializations and reflections that part has gone now you can have a lot of users working simultaneously in in large enterprises with their queries and dashboards and you can have low latency as well as high concurrency so the cost is not just in terms of the cost of the software but also in the skills cost the hardware cost you don't have to maintain two systems now data warehouses and data lakes or lake houses you can do everything on lake houses so yes read i would agree with that point yeah i think the you're right on you don't have to maintain those systems but uh, i think the market is there's still a lot of sort of education on like what does it mean to be in like a an iceberg or a delta lake almost dba right i mean all these things are uh, you're sort of taking over for many of the items that the where you know really what the warehouse does and you had distinct groups where you're like hey that's that's an oracle or that's a teradata dba or this is someone that's specific to administrating snowflake you know that's the table formats have a, have come online and you're sort of 
you know, creating, you know, with a lake in the table format, what it really feels like, you know, a, a data, you know, a data warehouse, a database, the skills have to come with that as well. And I think that is part of the change management for organizations, or we might even see faster adoption right now. Okay. Guys, I just want to call out uh, for everyone that's on. If if you can ask, you can ask questions whenever. We'll address them as we can. I have some of them pulled up, so um, as we go through the sessions, we can try to hit them in each section. One note I didn't call out is as I talked about reflections, which are query acceleration technology. Again, that's where we create a materialization, and then the query engine smart enough to recognize the materialization, so we can separate between the analysts and the engineers. That was not included in this TCO. We just did raw performance. Okay. And this is raw Dremio on Iceberg versus Snowflake's proprietary format when we looked at TCBDS on price performance. Okay, open table formats. So this is required for a lake house. Like you, you're going to need a table format to be able to do warehousing functionality on the lake. If you don't have this, you're really just talking about you know having a data lake with a query engine and doing analytics off the lake versus what's really bringing in all of the right DML type operations into the lake. So these formats have been huge. And this is the question we asked, like, have you adopted an open table format? And 56% had said they had. And then you can see sort of the group that's planning to adopt. So this really is showing, again, very similar to lake house adoption. If you've done this, you at least have some sort of use cases happening in a lake using that. It doesn't mean you fully adopted analytics and 100% of the analytics in your organization are running off a lake house, but it does mean you, you, you started that process and you started building out that capability within your enterprise. In this case, you can see the rest of the planned adoption, which is only 9%, right? So only 9% don't plan to adopt a table format and have a lake house. And so that sort of aligned with what I think, like there's a group that's out there that says, no, this is how my group needs to operate and we are going to continue to operate this way, et cetera. And there's everybody else who's looking forward and saying, hey, I want these flexibility and cost benefits. I want my, you know, my businesses to be able to move faster. We're part of driving a digital and AI change within our organization, which is most organizations in this case, 91%. Does that again, sort of align to what, what you've seen in terms of format adoption is like about halfway through, but there's about another half to go um, over the next three years. Yeah, I would agree with that. You know, Apache Iceberg came into the scene a little later, right? First, it was all Delta. It was all, you know, uh, the Delta format. Then there was a hoodie and then Iceberg. And, but though it came late, I think organizations and the engineers out there are realizing the value add of Iceberg being an open system. Right. Where because yeah. now we want to sort of decouple our engines, right, query engines like Spark, Flink, Hive from the actual data formats and data formats are this bone of contention. Right. It, it is it is sort of the core component of the lake house that transforms a data lake to the lake house. Right. And especially Apache Iceberg in terms of, you know, especially working with Remio's reflection, one of the major advantages I see is it can be incrementally updated, right? Which ensures maximum data freshness, which is a very important aspect as organizations are getting newer data. And also that minimizes the computational requirements, right? The other aspect of Apache Iceberg being is that it is um, with, with open table formats is they're not coupled to some proprietary catalogs. And that makes it again, very interoperable across the organization. So I, I would say this is the right approach. And I do see Apache Iceberg growing, especially this year, as organizations jump into lake houses to build more AI applications. So I think you're, you're stealing our next, Sorry. Our next <laughs> data point. No, it, it's really interesting because you talked about sort of Apache Iceberg coming in later. And, and Jose, I see your question. I'm, I'm gonna get to that as we get into the AI section. There's very short answers. We are a SQL query engine. Uh, we don't try to do direct translation from Python, but there are ways to use data frames. So that's sort of your a short answer to, to what you have there. I'll give you ways where we would recommend how customers would uh, process Python over their data lake, but you may not be doing that with Dremio specifically. Okay. So on this, this is what, Submit, you, you stole everything we were just going to talk, you know, I was going to talk about here, which is, look, Sorry. Delta Lake is the most adopted. And that, however, is changing. You know, in the next three years, as you're looking at planned adoption, Iceberg is the fastest growing. 
And so I actually did a poll. So we put this out on a poll on our social channel. And one of my predictions in my blog for 24 top trends is that iceberg will pass Delta Lake this year. It's going to flip this year. And we asked if people agreed with that, that prediction. And 75% said yes. Now, to be fair, this is on our social channel and, and as an organization, you know, like we don't have a, we support read only operations from Delta or Iceberg. Like we would love the world to be totally table agnostic, but you know, we, we invested in Iceberg because we saw it as the open format, right? It's the Apache project. And I'm going to show you why we think the planned adoption of Iceberg's growing. And honestly, it deals with the ecosystem. This isn't, this shouldn't be a surprise. This is from GitHub, which is, if you want to invest in the ecosystem that's going to give you the most flexibility, the most choice, and it doesn't matter, you know, depending on the way you want to set up your lake house environment, if it specifically is going to involve Dremio or not, the industry trend to me is very clear right now that people want the open ecosystem to give them the most choice. They are sick of being locked in. And, you know, honestly, Databricks is the way that they won't let you write into iceberg right it's very clearly the signal they're trying to get everybody into that ecosystem and you can just look at the 90 percent of contributions here between the two projects one is community and we take part of that but like you know we're not the nearly the only contributor we're actually like there's much larger contributors in the space to iceberg and by the way we're gonna you know our subsurface conference uh, always has a ton of iceberg sessions from the community which is in is may 2nd and 3rd so I recommend going and signing up for that. But this is sort of where the community comes together with lake houses and they're, they're talking about best practices and optimizations and all the stuff that go on here. So, you know, this is what we think is driving adoption of Iceberg. Now, is that, is this what you think it is too? Or do you feel like there's something outside of the ecosystem, you know, feature capability or something else that is really driving here for Iceberg's growth right now? I think feature-wise, Iceberg, Delta Lake, Hoodie, they are very close by, right? They are like a little bit here and there in terms of, you know, very edge cases and things like that. But I do certainly agree with what you are showing here in terms of the interoperability, the openness, right? Because the whole data stack today is highly disaggregated, right? Data engineers have to piece together different pieces, right? And believe it or not, data integration across these disaggregated data ecosystem takes up a huge amount of time in terms of compatibility, in terms of updates, upgrades happening across versions. So I think this definitely is a major area where Iceberg scores compared to anything else in terms of interoperability across different systems, different data types. And of course, the performance aspects, it's not losing by interoperability. It's not losing in terms of performance. It's keeping yep. its performance, right? So yes. Yeah, well, I mean, we we can see that too. We run all our benchmarks using Iceberg and we're doing really well uh, in that case. As you can see, like we're, we continue to win customers who are looking to offload from systems for more efficiency. You have more self-service, more efficiency. Those are the two big drivers. And, you know, and since we've invested more heavily in Iceberg, all of our, again, all of our right operations, everything we're doing from a DML perspective, all of that's Iceberg based. Mm -hmm. um, because again, as a company like ours, you can't invest in everything, right? We got to be great at a few things. And, and this is one of the ones that we, you know, we made a bet in. We thought this was going to win and it was really small at the time. And now it has really just taken off. And so we feel really great about the sort of the open environment that Iceberg's created in the lake house space. Next session is on data mesh. And you'll see as we get into data mesh, you know, we're really rotating into self-service and MTTI. Like those are really big drivers here. It's a lot of digital and AI transformation where the business wants to move faster. But I have an interesting data point, which is agility is not the main reason I thought it was going to be in the data that people are adopting data mesh. So I think we're going to have a lot of discussion on that slide. And we're going to think we need to talk about this slide too, Sumit, which is you know, we when we did this survey, we got 84% saying they fully or partially implemented data mesh. And if it was 84% saying partial implementation, I could believe that in terms of the customers that I talked to, whether they put something in place around self-service, whether they think about that from a unified semantic layer or elements around query federation or some parts of unification there, or if they think, you know, I would say that's probably one of the first 
pill of the four pillars that gets adopted of data mesh. I could see that, but to see 50% say they're fully implemented, I think this meant like they're philosophically they're bought in to data mesh, but I don't buy based on my conversations with customers at all. And based on how much goes into like doing federated computational, federated governance as a pillar, like I, I haven't talked to a single customer, to be honest, who's fully, you know, who I would say is, is fully implemented that. I think a lot have the mentality about how are they going to distribute data ownership, data pipeline ownership into lines of business and all of this again, to, to sort of spur you know, how do we not be the bottleneck as a central engineering team? And how do we get data adoption really going? That all makes sense to me, but this stat didn't make any sense to me. And so my interpretation of it was much more about, this is a philosophically, they're saying we're going to be fully implementing this. What you know, What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, definitely. I mean, you know, data mesh is a definitely a very sort of a not well understood um, concept. And there are a lot of pillars, the four major pillars of data mesh. Now, data mesh is also more than the technology aspect. It's also an organizational change where organizations need to follow what we did in the data platform, what we did in the actual software development platform, where we're, where we're using domain-based uh, design, right? domain-driven design, where we are trying to decentralize because centralized data platforms have become a bottleneck data engineers are getting burnt out by you know too many requests integrating with too many data sources building hundreds of data pipelines so i also think that 50 percent fully implemented with data mesh is definitely very much on the higher side yeah. and i think i agree with you it's more philosophic that yes we buy into that concept that paradigm but we may not have implemented a full set of all the capabilities in data mesh yes yeah, I mean, I think what we're seeing is there's a big trend to people want one platform. We like, and a lot of them have this name, like a name for the central, you know, for the platform they're going to have. But if they think about the one Lake House platform, we'll call it one data and analytics and AI platform, you know, there's a lot of different components that make that up. If you go and end up drawing sure. the architectures out, right, where you're like, you're doing the stacks and the layers and you have sort of the tools that are being used. But for each one, they want essentially its own, you know, to go back to the term data mart, you know, they want sort of their own ownership, you know, data marts going on for each lines of bit, uh, line of business and allow them to sort of self-own and self-manage those, but in the construct of one platform. And so you can go and inherit policies from things like Previsera and apply them, you know, mm -hmm. across all the lines of business. But you have this feeling within the line of business that like you can go off and run. And, you know, just from personal experience, like when I was at AWS in the marketing team, we had our own data and analytics team. You know, we created our own data mart. Like we were using that, you know, we were copying from the central warehouse. Again, another copy ETL jobs, long running ETL jobs that broke and all the things that go into that. I think people still want that agility and flexibility. I know we did. That's what, what led to the creation of all of these. So how do you provide that sort of data mart feel to the organizations, but you still have it in overall one platform? We actually think so. This is something that Drummy is great at with this concept we have called spaces. Like you can isolate really well in between the different lines of business. But we think data mesh is sort of this is the construct for I have one platform and I'm going to then give you, you know, have these different lines of business, you know, manage their data products, get insights from the data products, be able to bring their own data in to enrich and mix with central data products. And so they create this architecture that really, you know, provides the, all the quality of data that you'd want, instead of like, you get these marts that turn into, again, swamps essentially very quickly, but you get all the agility that's baked into it. And so they're trying to bridge the two worlds. Do you agree with that? Oh, absolutely. And I do see one of the major, you know, components required for implementing data mesh successfully is the ability to do self-service, right? As each of these domain teams, they don't want to build the full infrastructure stack, right? Though they are full stack team yeah. that is provided by a centralized infrastructure team to provide. And Remio provides these, these kind of um, capabilities to do self-service 
along with providing capabilities to do unified views across different data sources, because one domain team could be using data from another domain team and the ability to share data yeah, through yeah. a semantic layer in a self-service way is the core, right, for the data mesh adoption. So in, in my opinion, Gremio has all the components with Iceberg as the table format to provide these capabilities. Yeah, in a I mean, very reusable really way. Yeah, the thing that we're used for, for sure. You know, but I just think in, in general and trend, there's there are a bunch of ways people can can hack this together, and and the technology is one piece of the solution. But this is a really core use case for us because of the uh, of the set of capabilities we bring to the market. You know, as I look at the next slide, you know, you're talking about a unified semantic layer. You sort of set this one up, right? 50% of more than 21 data sources. This is of our responses with 10% having more than 100. And so someone just asked, was this survey only made to Dremio customers? Absolutely not. This is run by a third party. We actually, it's anonymous. You know, we know the roles of who responded. We know the company sizes. We know the enterprise split, but we don't know the, the exact specifics. And so it was fielded out to be a diverse population of data leaders and data professionals across the organ, uh, across the marketplace. Right. Yeah. So thanks for for who did that. And Rob on the last point made a comment of just like, yeah, having having the license or the ability to go and create, you know, a data mesh, you know, technology stack is one thing, but it's a whole nother thing to be able to like have that implemented, right? And implementing it takes a massive amount of uh, not just technology implementation, but cultural change uh, and training uh, across an organization, right? People process technology. All right. Yeah, fifty percent of more than twenty-one data, uh, twenty or, or I have more than twenty-one data sources was uh, exactly what we expected. Actually, you know, people are trying to bring data together to enable better discovery, so people can view the get the views that they need to be able to build the um, to deliver the dashboards and analytics capabilities that they want to. So we've absolutely seen this, and this is something we'll touch on a little bit in the AI section, which is one of the main use cases, at least we see from data scientists, is this ability to very quickly bridge data from multiple sources together, create the view that they need, and then work with that view in their technology, you know, whether it's open source or an enterprise AI technology of choice. I was actually doing it uh, the other day in terms of uh, compiling data across multiple sources. I took that data and used an auto ML tool to do a bunch of feature engineering and to look at and to look at the the coefficients, right? The coefficients that we're trying to predict in my case as, you know, predicting things that are related to marketing. And it was super useful in terms of being able to bridge. We have multiple data sources too. And we, we, you know, we drink our own champagne and have our own lake house. And, you know, I have my own space and uh, for my marketing team. And so we, we run this too. We have the same problem uh, as a lot of organizations that we talk to. Related to that is when we looked at what's driving data mesh, while the highest total percentage was 36% coming from a central data platform team and saying, hey, we want to start driving this data mesh initiative, which again, we, we tend to link to, you know, self-service, lowering mean time to insight, uh, providing better agility, uh, delivering a culture, a data culture, like all of these things relate into, I think, how data mesh is interpreted with an organization. I think less people are like, I have to do these four pillars. This is the only way to do these four pillars. It's the only way. I think it's a general construct for moving, you know, for moving quickly and driving uh, transformational change. And so when we looked at that, though, about line of business, business leaders, right, 8.7% here and the line of business data teams, right? So the central data teams, and then there's the data teams in the line of business, like I was talking about, we had at AWS. If you add those up, it actually is ahead of the central platform teams, which is 41% of those actually driving the initiative are coming from the business. And that's not actually a massive surprise to me. In some ways, I could almost imagine that it's even bigger, but you can see the sort of, we'll say the other business construct related to this is this is the digital transformation office, which we asked about specifically. And then, hey, are you actually getting this from the CEO as a drive where we have to move faster? We have to become more of a data-driven organization. And that's, those are the terms we hear a lot from our enterprise customers, data-driven organization, data-driven transformation, digital transformation. And so if you look at all that, right, you're talking now over almost 65% about two thirds of the drivers are coming from the business side. And so that to me is very interesting, but also coming from the business side myself, 
not surprising because if I'm not getting this from my central data team, like I'm going nuts because I want to move as fast as possible. And my goal is like, I want to know the answer to this question. I want that right now. Like I want it by the end of this webinar and I need an ability to go make that happen. And things like the data mesh concert, the data mesh architecture allow our teams to be able to have that type of self-service uh, ability while still doing it in a governed manner to ensure that the, the data that we're bringing in is continued to be maintained and that it's a, a and you're, I'm sort of setting up the next slide in terms of data quality right now, but data quality still ends up becoming a huge construct instead of just allowing myself to make an entire mess and create a swamp in over all the GTM and marketing org. Sumit, what it, what's your reaction to that? You know, 65% sort of having a business, a business driver around data mesh. Yeah, I, I think this is a win-win, right? Both for the business as well as the central platform team, right? Because businesses want to need velocity. They want to build, they want to quickly iterate on their product ideas, build data products and solve business problems, right? They don't want to get bottlenecked by the platform team not being able to ingest data, for example, from a certain data source. And it helps the central platform team also to, by providing capabilities of self-service, interfaces that can be used by these business units, they reduce their amount of workload and you know avoid burnout. So I think this is the right approach. And that's one of the reasons why data mesh is always um, you know, a very good idea is it helps the line of businesses to move fast, provides velocity, of course, agility and data quality and all that, which we'll come to. So definitely this is the right, it speaks logically to me. So the, the numbers are very logical to me. Yeah, well, my guess here is that the central data platform leaders who are doing this and then getting the value and results from it are put in very high regard because it Ooh. shows like they understand the pain of the business. They understand like, you know, what's happening around all the questions we're trying to do around margin right now, around how you're going to deal with growth in the current economic environments and all those pieces versus just my job is to bring data in. And Right. The, the job of the data is to drive the business. And so the connection from this group, I think, is really strong in here. And then they elevate themselves um, within organizations. And so to be honest, because of what Dremio does, we probably interact with more of those types of data leaders who are like, you know, I am trying to push the organization forward. And I think that's in general, we see that going very well for them. Okay, this is the question, you know, I'm managing time now, so I gotta, I gotta get through this because we got the AI section still, which is, I thought when I did this survey out that we were gonna see agility and time to insight and, or things around improved data access here as the number one thing. You know, why are we doing this? Okay, we want everyone to run faster. And I know that's a driver and it's in here as a driver. But what I didn't expect was that quality and governance were gonna be one and two. And this just tells me that the the const, like th this is my hypothesis of how I read this data. I guess it's my opinion. Like, I don't know if this is true, okay? But what I think happens is if the businesses aren't getting access to, let's call it like either your silver data or your gold data sets, and then that's exactly what they need to be able to run fast. And then they're not given the keys to be able to say, I'm going to add this data in, or I have ownership, and I'm going to be able to create the views I want and run fast, that they go and do it on the side. They're finding a way to hack it together in Excel sheets and different copies, and they're pulling it into maybe a SQL server database or who knows what they're doing, but they're going to make it happen because they're getting hammered from up top to go deliver the business result. And so my sense is when you look at that, what ends up suffering? Data quality does because you have 50,000 copies of the truth. You don't know what the truth is. That, that truth isn't maintained. Again, you don't have a semantic layer on top. So the way I read this was like, oh, the reason I don't have governance is because now I have data copies everywhere because the business is up doing whatever the heck it wants to do. And we can't have that because we need to govern all our data. And all these other companies have been fined by not governing their data and all this bit. And so it's like, how do I bridge the two worlds where I want security and governance and I want agility and access? To me, those things conflict. You know, they're starting to butt heads and a data mesh architecture helps to solve that. All right, Sumit, what do you, that's my interpretation of this data. I was sort of shocked by it. Yeah. 
I'm actually a, a little, a, a, a very happy to see this number here, data quality, because it goes to, you know, as we are going to talk about AI, right? AI absolutely by itself will not do much if your data is bad, right? And data quality being such a high percentage here makes me happy that, yes, organizations are thinking about data quality as they are going to do their next-gen AI applications. The other part is data mesh drives data quality very logically because a lot of times centralized data teams, data engineers don't know much about the business, the business rules or the business data, the business semantics, right? While when we move this part with a data mesh, because now the each of line of business are doing their whole implementation, you have domain data experts who can build much better data quality because they know the domain rules, the businesses. So I think this aligns very well to the technology trends and to the trends around um, you know, quality and data mesh. Yes. Oh, we agree. Yeah. A AI is a great call out. Should have brought that up. I'm sure a big part, part of this is having bad quality data and training a model on it. That's going to be a production model is super dangerous. And so it's putting an increased viewpoint and burden on ensuring that all the data that's brought in has been maintained. You know, related to that, I'm going to talk about something that Dremio does with what we think of as Git inspired data version control, which is how do you keep your data clean all the time? And so this is part of our lake house management capabilities. So just like you would do in Git, you take your main, you this is think of it like a data product. This is my data product and I want to add more data to it. I can branch it. Again, this is just a pointer. So I'm not making a copy. This is a pointer back to the main data. And then I'm going to add the data in. Once that data is added in, I'm going to run a data quality check on it. Maybe I'm using something like, you know, Monte Carlo here, right? Or I can run it on my own scripts, but I'm checking to see, did I get the result I want? If not, I now go back and I say, well, I still have this version. I haven't even published this yet. Let me troubleshoot. I know the problem is right here. Can only be right there because it's the only data I added when I did the check and the check failed and now I'm back here. Only after the check's complete do I merge it and now this becomes the next version of a customer data set. And you can do the same thing on the data science side, which is I can take that entire product, right? And I can go and just say, look, I'm going to have a pointer for experimentation in terms of doing something like feature engineering on that. Okay, I'm not creating a copy. It's just a pointer back. So now I can actually work with that branch of the data, do the feature engineering. If I want to go save those features, I can dump those back into the lake. And then at the end of doing that, I can just kill the branch. Instead of merging, I just kill the branch. And I'm not creating all these expensive copies and expensive environments to go deal with. And so we see this as a really core fundamental shift in how data is managed. And so we're, we're really excited about that concept because it ties back into managing data as a product. And we believe that we're now creating the, the easiest way to create and manage data products. And we, we see that direct tie-in into overall data mesh architectures and then back to data quality and agility uh, for organizations. We also think this is gonna be something that enables lines of business data teams to own more of their pipelines, taking load off the central teams and allowing the central teams to focus on the core ingest of, of all the data sources that they need into the Lakehouse environment. And Sumit, I know you talked about this at the very top in terms of looking at Git-inspired data management. Are you seeing this elsewhere in the market right now? Or are you primarily seeing this from us? Lake right, there's an open source Lake. version of this called Nessie. So you can go, everything we do has an open source component, like Apache Arrow we talked about. Exactly. And and that's the good part about it, how you integrate, how Dremio integrates with the open source components, right? Lake FS and, and Project Nessie, where, you know, and this is a very important invention, I would say, in the data world, where you want to keep track of your data without really making copies. Copies of data create another data silo. They sort of, creates increased surface area for data breaches, and then you have to maintain the copies, right? Keep, keep them synced. So this whole technology about Git-inspired data management where is actually very important, especially for data scientists when they want to do lineage tracking, when they want to you know, understand how a particular number is showing on their reports or on the models, right? You can do all the without making data copies. 
So absolutely, this is still very new, but the awareness and adoption is growing, is what I am seeing. Awesome. Hey, we got a question here, Shemin. I'm going to fill this one and then I'll, I'll take it myself too, depending on what I'm going to give this one to you, which is John just asked, in a data mesh architecture, who would your respondents say? And now in this case, I'm just going to interpret this as like, how would organizations or customers say is responsible for the semantic interoperability in the context of data quality? So I would say the responsibility for the semantic interoperability of the context of data resides, yeah, there's a lot of terms here, resides solely on the line of business because they understand the data. It is they who are going to implement the data quality rules with great expectations or with Monte Carlo or things like that. And the data engineering team or the infrastructure team will just provide them the infrastructure to do that part. They will not be involved in, in the data quality aspects of it. Data oh, yeah. engineering team probably will just say, you know, okay, we ingested 100,000 rows, you got 100,000 rows. But the semantic aspects of those 100,000 rows is whether they are valid, they make sense, they have the right cardinality and things like that is more on the line of business. Yeah, but I see it. I mean, I personally see it on the engineer, on the data team that's supporting the line of business versus yes, on yes. the data consumer. I, I don't think the consumer <laughs> in my, in, in this case, from what I see, the consumer is a stakeholder and a critical stakeholder. If you're thinking about like a from, from a racy perspective, but not the actual one responsible, the one responsible is the one who owns the data product. Correct, All right. Correct, correct. That's what I meant. Like you yes. might be blending data from a from a central source and then you're bringing in your own data, right? And you're blending that together and you're creating your data model within the person who's owning that. I think they're owning the semantic interoperability of that product. And that's what I've seen. It's a great question. So these things are these things are still evolving. And we're starting right. again again to get closer to like what is a data contract and then who's responsible exactly. for the contract exactly. and what's involved in that. And these are things we're thinking about in Dremio as as the market continues to evolve is how do we ensure there's ownership and SLA on these products so that you know when it's been updated and you, there's a problem, you know who to call and who's responsible. It's really important in a feder in a more federated and decentralized uh, ownership model. So thanks for the question, John. Okay, AI. This is like the biggest not surprise of probably the whole thing. So yeah, 81% are using a lake house. I, I assume you've seen this I and mean, we've heard about AI being massive here. I do want to touch on one question from the start that I said I was going to get to, and we're obviously running right at the end. So I want to make sure I get I get to the questions, which is, you know, does Dremio manage some Python scripts? You know, there are ways, right, where we can translate the Python into a SQL engine. Um, what I'd say we see our customers do mainly as it relates to AI is they're joint they're they're using it for access for the data scientists. So they're bridging the different data sets together and they're able to create the views of the data that they want to work with. That's primarily where we see and we see them operating in SQL and we see them pushing more and more to SQL because again, it it expands the number of people who can be involved in that uh, data science process. Right, there's still going to be like your hardcore data scientists who do are are working with everything sort of from raw data in the lake and building everything from scratch in Python. They're they're probably they're going to need a scale out Python engine, for example, Spark. And guess what? Spark works great with Iceberg, so totally fine to have yep. that as of your Iceberg of your overall lake house architecture. But we see a lot of the processing happening in SQL more and more. And then again, like one of the things you just saw us talking about in terms of version control is now I can version a model and I can align it to a version of data. So version of data, that is the one that trained the model, super important, right? Because now I can do governance, right? And at any point I can go back and say, okay, what was that? How would have the model been predicted? I can keep that going on. So that's why we're really excited about um, Get Inspired Data version control as it relates to AI. You have anything else to add on this one, Sumit, in terms no, of like processing I, I, it, you're seeing customers use on the lake house and, and, and how people are, again, working more with like, you know, unstructured data and sort of combining these elements together? 
Yeah, I think Lakehouse, as I said earlier, is probably the best platform to work with unstructured data where a lot of the AI applications are going to be based out of it, right? And unstructured data can be text, image, audio, video, right? And with the Lakehouse being an open platform where you can integrate any sort of any dif and di different tools or different libraries, processing these becomes much more, processing unstructured data becomes much more easier in a Lakehouse than in a cloud data warehouse or in an on-prem warehouse, right? So this again looks very logical um, in terms of adoption rates as organizations are looking to go to Gen AI and AI based applications, their step to a lake house makes the most sense, right? Yeah, uh, we've seen that too. And again, like, you know, we see different, we see SQL and then we see Python. It's so again, there's just been this massive resurgence in SQL, especially as people are getting yeah. transformations into the SATs, et cetera. But at some point, a lot of it does move over to Python, you know, there's, and then there's R out there as well. So I think the advantage of the lake house, you know, once you set up that architecture is you, have, it's tool flexibility, right? Like you can pick exactly. the people you need to go work with that data. And if that's an enterprise tool, like there again, they're going to have to continue to earn your business because you have that ecosystem now built up. Well, especially around iceberg, I should say, you have that ecosystem built up. And so you have the cho choice of tools to work with for the job you're trying to complete. And then, you know, I think this is a jump from what I've seen. You know, when I was at H2O, we sort of saw like for every 12, 20 models that were built, maybe one made it into production. Mm -hmm. And when we talk to customers, the main problem with that is that the AI teams, which are a lot of times at the point, they were sort of like research teams, like they were off on their own, just trying to say, hey, how can I add value? they weren't talking to the business to solve the business problem. And what I see by this growth of the numbers of models in production is I think that's starting to be solved, which is the business teams are starting to work with the data science teams to say, this is the problem I want to solve. And they're starting to understand how to pass requirements together. And, you know, this isn't different from what happened in software development, right? Like people built all these apps and they never thought about the user of the apps and now you can see usability is front and center and the way that translation of requirements happens from, hey, this is the problem I'm trying to solve to how do I go do that, I think is evolving into the AI space now. Sumit, are you, what, what are you, what are, I know we're basically at time. Are you, are you seeing the same thing there? Yeah, the number of, you know, experimental models going into production is definitely on the rise. Organizations are learning the value value of operationalization, right? The ML ops capabilities, things like um, feature store, or keeping track of the experiments, and the whole end to end CI CD with machine learning and uh, and the models. It's definitely on the rise. The the learning curve, the maturity is increasing. Yes, guys, I know we're out of time. You know, in summary, you know, for Dremio, really focused on shifting left, low, reducing your MTTI and costs while you're growing adoption and the, the three components that we think you need to go do that. And if you want the full report, there's way more information than what we put in this. Like I just gave you maybe 10% of what's in the report. It's all written up white paper format. You can get that here. We're gonna send it out. And we also, we have free versions. So we have a community edition, which is again, you can use for free for forever. And you can download that and you can get started and test it out. And you can also do that in the cloud. We actually don't have time limits. You can just download it in the cloud, attach your, either Azure or AWS resources to it and start experimenting for free. So that's how you get started. I want to thank you all. Thank you all for attending. Please let me know if you have more questions, you can hit me up on LinkedIn. And by the way, we're going to keep doing this survey. So if you want to know things each year, that would be really beneficial to you. Ideally, the survey is honestly just created for you and we'll ensure we get those questions in next year for you. Yeah, you gave just the tip of the iceberg for all this data, right? <laughs> in the webinar. So definitely, please go ahead and check those two reports.